Hi, my name is Nancy Miller. Nice to meet everyone. And hello, I'm Sid Peroni. Thanks for having us. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, so here we, this is our main page. Just wanted to share. These are the dates we, we had for our show. Many thanks to the college, to Magda, and for everyone coming. And there's our, you know, our emails, our websites. If anyone needs to get in contact with us, we have our Instagram accounts in there as well. First topic, we want to just kind of talk through some of the influences that have over time influenced us as artists and now in, in the past, present, and future. Okay, so for me, my background's painting. I started painting when I was nine years old. I got to see the Water Lily show at the Met when I was 18. I was in high school and it just pretty much changed my life. It was amazing. So always been one of my favorite, favorite artists. I just love the light, love the color, love the textures. I'm just a big, huge fan. And one of these days I'll get to go to Giverny. Ansel Adams, of course, from a photography standpoint, I studied painting, photography, and graphics when I was in college. Loved the tonality. Edward Weston was another one of my favorites. Um, just loved black and white photography. Just everything he shot. I, at one point, I wanted to be him obviously. <laughs> um, Aaron Siskind. Um, actually, I've had a couple people tell me some of my graphic work reminds me of him. Um, he taught at the Rhode Island School of Design, and if I would have had the gumption back in the day, that's where I would have gone, <laughs> but I did not. Um, art, contemporary artists, um, photographers that I really love is Diana Bloomfield. She does by gum bichromate, which it's just a beautiful, beautiful process. It reminds me of painting and just that softness that she gets in her imagery is just phenomenal. And uh, Wendy Schneider, she does gold work and just beautiful. Her, her photography looks like painting as well. I really kind of gravitate toward that. Okay, and then for me, um, I've been predominantly a, a black and white photographer. Um, so my first major influence, I think, uh, other than, you know, Ansel Adams, again, and the zone system and all that good stuff was minor white. Um, and I think what really, drew, a couple of things drew me to minor white and, and one was what you can see here, which is, uh, it's form, uh, and texture, um, the light in the dark, the shadows, the interplay with the, with all of that. And also he, um, he also believed that as a photographer, he could learn a lot about himself and his spirit, the spiritual side of himself from his photographs. And in particular, he liked to, um, to arrange his photographs in, in a different order. And he, he thought that um, doing that uh, revealed a lot about his, his spiritual side as well. All right, and then if I start to talk about the gold leaf work that I do today, um, Probably the, I have to say that I did not invent that process. Um, that process as I'm doing it today was invented by a man named Dan Burkholder. And he does analog processes. So he first did it with um, silver print, palladium prints, and then backing it with gold leaf. So it was all, his prints were all precious metals. Um, but it goes back further than that. Really the origins of gold leaf work go back to a thing called oratones. And oratones were done, were photographs done on glass and, and backed with gold leaf. And there's an artist uh, today who is, is a current artist. She's still working. Her name is Kate Brakey. Um, if you want to see some beautiful um, gold leaf work, certainly look at Kate. She does, she prints on glass and backs with gold leaf. Um, and then, of course, we have to thank Dan Burkholder for pulling us all into the digital age and making it a little more accessible. Um, but then after that, um, there is a new duo called Alberon Cabrera. And, you know, if you're, if folks are here, I brought a book of theirs. These little snippets of their gold work simply don't do it justice. Um, they're just phenomenal. Um, but again, if you have a chance after we talk today, take a look at the book. It's, it's really pretty. Um, but I think what I like about their work besides the gold is that there's something unexpected about their compositions as well. 
Um, they just, they can juxtapose two different, seemingly two different elements or one element and turn it in a provocative way. And I, I find that really inspirational. And then um, I, I do like painting. Um, I just discovered Dorothy Fratt. Uh, she spent the latter years in Arizona, but I just absolutely fell in love with her work, her paintings. And she's, you know, she's deceased now, but they're going to have a, an exhibition of her work at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art this fall, and I cannot wait to see them in person. But I think the thing that inspires me about Dorothy's work Again, is I, again, I don't do much color. I do a little bit of color. But with Dorothy, Dorothy's work, to me, the color is a shape again. So I, I just love how she, um, how the shapes relate to each other. And also something that I'm trying to do a little bit more in my work, which is she plays with the edges of that canvas in very interesting ways. I mean, it's not traditional composition, you know, rule of thirds or any of that wonderful stuff that you learn when you first start being a photographer. And I, I just like it all balances, I think somewhat because of the color as well as the shape. So I'd like to, I, I just feel that this is a real inspiration for my work going forward. Okay. So we thought we'd also share our studio space yes. with you guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just for fun. Okay, and my studio space encompasses one of our bedrooms at the house. I've pretty much converted the closet into just a whole bunch of shelving areas for my printer, just storage. Um, basically, it's three walls that I'm showing here. And of course, my auxiliary is the bathroom. <laughs> so that's kind of where I hang, at, you know, as, um, as I'm doing my work, the gesso work, um, I hang them up so that they can dry and hang in there. So it's just a lot of fun. Just um, and I cleaned it right before I shot all this too. So <laughs> it doesn't look like this on a normal day. Uh, and unlike Nancy, I did not <laughs> clean before I shot this. So you're going to see a little bit more of what, what my studio is really like. Again, it's a space with an extra bedroom in my house. And I also use uh, the bathroom for analog processes, cyanotype, gum by chromate, um, and phytograms, that sort of thing that I do. This is just one closet, okay? <laughs> Just, just one closet crammed with every conceivable material and it's just a mess. <laughs> and then looking around in the room. So the left picture, you can just sort of see, this is where I have, I store my paper, that desk, that part of the desk is where I do my gold leaf work typically. Uh, the second photograph is a, is a UV uh, light box for doing cyanotype, well, cyanotypes are mostly done by chromate work. Um, and then there's my desk, my computer, where I try to write, you know, I try to journal in the morning if I can, and that's where I do that. And then on the right, and the last picture there is a printer and just a, an Epson printer that I use. So I can print, I print all my things at home and I can do up to a 17 by 22 on that printer. And of course you can see all of that lovely um, waste underneath there. <laughs> <laughs> in the bathroom, well, I'm not even going to show you that. <laughs> or the other three closets full of stuff. Yeah. Um, gesso, the gesso prints, also by Dan Barkhalter. So he's the one pretty much invented that process as well. Similar to, well, just like the gold, the gold leaf. So similar process. Um, we do print vellum paper is needed. So um, it's printed on the front side of the paper. Uh, then you spray it with triple clear glaze. And I do it front and back. From there, I prep it um, for the gesso. So I, I mask out the image all the way to the edge of the image itself so that it has a really clean edge. And then I spray, I use spray gesso and I spray the entire back. And then I go back again with the glaze on top of it. So Hopefully, this will sh we actually have pieces that we can pass around and people can take a look at it. But this is just the image digitally printed right off my printer at home on vellum. And you can see that it's still, you know, the color isn't as vibrant. Um, there's no spray on this yet. So the next image, it does have the glaze. You can see, you know, there's a little bit of glare in there. It's sprayed front and back. Okay, and then on the left side is just the image itself 
And I use a really, it's like a thick foam core. It's about an inch to an inch and a quarter thick. It's just easy to maneuver. Um, I can do different sizes on there. And so it's taped and I put um, the, the front obviously is facing the board. And on the right hand side is how I tape it. And I tape it all the way around so that I don't get any spray on the vellum itself. Okay, and this is the final image. And you can see how, you know, once it's got the glaze on there, the color is popping more. And with the, the gesso on the back, you can really see the color pop through. And you know, let's see where are we here? And then all, I just kind of showing like all three together. So the left is just printed on the vellum, the right is sprayed with the triple glaze, and the bottom image is all of it composed together. So you can kind of see the differences as the image progresses and following the whole steps that Dan Burkhalter uses. And we thought we'd just add some tips. Spray gesso is great. And if you decide to do the process, you really need to shake that can for a good 15 minutes because it is, it's <clears throat> gesso. So there is some grit in there and you really got to get it shaken really well to kind of get that smoothness out of it. Otherwise it'll start spurting and, um, and it can look, it'll feel like sandpaper and actually can come off. Like if you don't shake it enough. Um, and I typically use three to four coats in all directions. So, and I, I just turn the print around as I and spray all the different directions. I also notice too, that in the summertime down in the valley, because you don't typically have the kind of weather we have down in the valley, but it does crack, it does crackle. So I think what happens is as you're spraying the gesso and it's so hot and drying so quickly, it starts to crack, like crack a little, little all over the place. Some in certain spots and some doesn't and some not, but you can get liquid gesso and kind of use a brush and kind of fill in the spots. So you can do that. Um, tape choices, if you want like a really clean edge, I use it right around the, right around the image, just artist tape. And then I just use any type of paper to kind of cover the rest of the vellum on the outside. And then make sure you're spraying everything outside as well, especially with the triple clear glaze. That is really, the smell is really, really potent and it kind of sticks in the air. So you really don't want to do that in the house because um, the it just really evaporates. Those fumes are pretty, pretty heavy. And then I allow it to dry about 30 minutes with the triple clear glaze before I spray the gesso. And then the last coat is a triple clear glaze over the gesso. And I let that sit for 24 hours before, you know, um, framing it or putting, you know, putting it in my portfolios just to, to keep. And then just, it's just important to take your time and just take it slow. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, it is an easy process and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Gold leaf, my process. So it's very, it's very similar to what um, Nan does. Um, and I'm gonna, these are just basic steps, but I'm just gonna go ahead and move forward here. It's a little easier. Okay. So the first thing I do is I pick my image and I print that image digitally. It's an inkjet print. So it's our archival pigment print on, on the uh, vellum stock. And I let that dry overnight. If you're working with a smaller size, like an eight and a half by 11, and depending upon how much ink gets laid down, sometimes that paper will want to curl. So you just want to put something on it to kind of until it dries. Okay. And the bigger sheets don't seem to do that so much. Um, and let that dry overnight. Okay. So there's a couple of different things that you can do um, that are a little different than the gesso prints. Um, when I get, after the print has dried, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna flip that print over to the back side, right? And that's where the gold leaf is gonna go. So there are a couple of schools of thought here. So when you apply the varnish, right, on the back, what that, what that really is for at this stage is making the vellum paper look a little more translucent. So whatever goes on the back, whether that's you know Nan's gesso or my gold leaf, it's going to make that show up a little bit more and add to the depth of the image, right? So 
I can sometimes I will varnish the back first and sometimes I won't. If I want the gold to show up more, I might varnish the back first before putting the gold leaf on. If I don't want it to, if I want it to be more subtle, then I won't do that until the very until the very end. But we'll kind of get to that. Um, so and again, I'm saying so varnish or no coating at this stage is, is an option. Okay. And I use varnish, you could use triple thick clear glaze, you can use um, Kamar varnish, I guess. There's different things you can use depending upon what you like to work with. Okay, so the next step is I'm now gonna prepare that print. Uh, we're just gonna say now that I've decided that I'm not going to put any varnish on the back of my print this time. But now what I'm gonna do is I have to apply what they call a size to, uh, and that's the adhesive that makes the gold leaf stick to the back of the, of the print. Okay, so, so at any rate, um, and I will say what I use to mask off my print is just copy paper. You can use whatever you wish. And then I, I put that on a piece of um, mat board too, okay, as my base. So, and I, if my tip is when you tape, I use obviously just blue painters tape. I usually take it off the roll and do it on my jeans a little bit to take a little bit of the tackiness off of that paint before I apply it onto uh, the print. Um, but I would just advise you do north and south first, as you see there, and then the east and west or left and right strips. Because when you go to take these masking sheets off, you'll have to do that before you apply the gold leaf. If you don't do it this way, you're going to have pieces of masking paper just coming off in every direction, and you're going to get that in the sizing, and it's going to be a mess. Okay, so so my goal here again is now I'm I'm trying to make sure that I've got my print down on that baseboard. I have masked around where I want the gold leaf to be, right? So in the photo on the right, where the inside of that blue tape is where the gold leaf is going to go. That's where the sizing gets get sprayed and where the gold leaf is going to go. And so I want to make sure everything around that doesn't get any glue because again that's going to make a mess and you've got to pick up these tiny little sheets of of gold leaf if you don't you know if you get glue anywhere else it, it's going to cause you a problem okay all right so here's a close-up of once i've sprayed the sheet with the sizing so you're going to notice that okay so the big part on the left is the print is the back of the print the blue on the right of course is the masking tape and that white line is going to give me it's also sprayed with the adhesive so in the end that's going to give me a little gold border around my image and you can do that or you can do no border i could have scooted that tape right up flush with the image itself so that you wouldn't see any gold outside when you're all done or some uh people actually take their image and they'll put like a little black border around it it's kind of like a little safe zone for them. So really, it just depends on what you how you want your final image to look. <clears throat> okay, so this kind of shows you now after I bring that, of course, again, I am also working outside. So after I bring that that whole piece of uh, masked print and and uh, matte board inside, I take that masking off and I take the print off and I put it here on top of my work surface, which in, in my case ha happened to be a glass desktop. So again, there's no sizing or glue on what you're seeing up there on my desktop other than where the image is and a little bit of a border outside the image. Um, I also discovered that if you do it on something uh, on a surface that's other than really smooth, you may get a texture when you apply the gold leaf. And that could be a great thing. You may like doing that. I think I did one time, I think I did it on top of a, uh, of a mat board and it was a bit of a textured mat board. And when I was done putting a gold leaf onto the print, it had that same texture on it. So it's just sort of hit and miss, but just keep that in mind. So you can kind of see at the top there, that's a book of the gold leaf, which you know, you'll know you be able to see here in a minute too. There's uh, some tape, that, the masking tape that I use. The little, the little pimento jar on the right <laughs> is where I put all my excess gold leaf. And I do save it. I save it for patching basically. And um, another technique which we can talk about later. And then I have a little tiny X-Acto uh, blade and a little bit of brush. And you'll see what we do with those in a sec. Okay, so this is what the gold leaf looks like. It's, a, it's like about a two and a quarter inch square. And um, 
you can get different kinds of gold leaf. Uh, I get it in a booklet and it's specifically, specifically called transfer leaf or patent leaf. And you need that because that gives you that tiny little tissue transfer sheet that you're seeing up there. And that's how you're gonna hold it. Otherwise, you just get this loose piece of gold leaf and it's just gonna fly everywhere. It touches your fingers, it sticks to your fingers. It's crazy. So you always wanna, always wanna pick up your little sheet of gold leaf by that extra edge there, by that tissue edge. So here's a picture of me working. So now I am just applying that two and a quarter square gold leaf onto the back of the print and it's just basically layering. So I overlap each sheet a little bit as I go until I cover the entire back. Um, this can be a little nerve wracking. You, you know, if you shake, which sometimes I do, you know, you, you go like this and you put it down. And of course now the, that tiny little thin piece of gold leaf has now cracked everywhere. Don't panic. You can patch it, <laughs> keep going. The, the worst thing you can do at this point is go too fast because of that, that tissue paper transfer sheet, right? Because there's a little edge of that that's gonna to be touching that adhesive. So you don't want it to stick to your print. Otherwise now you have ruined your print and you will be starting over. So what I am doing here is I, am, I take my finger and I burnish the gold leaf onto the image and onto the, like here you can see I've already put a sheet down and I'm doing the second one. But I take care when I burnish it with my finger not to, to touch those areas or apply any uh, pressure to the areas that they're just tissue and not gold leaf. Um, and then sometimes, so then when I, I, you have to pick up that transfer sheet, right? So that's where that little exacto blade comes in. I'll take the little exacto blade, lift, lift that corner up. And again, the worst thing you could do is panic and go, ah, I got to get it off. Guarantee it'll stick every single time. So just very slowly pick up the corner. It, it might try start to make you feel like, oh, it's starting to stick. Don't worry, don't panic. Just very slowly, very <laughs> gently, just pull it off. And most of the time it will come off just fine. Um, and you can kind of see me doing that here with that exacto blade. And you can see now I've got I've got more layers, more squares on the back there. And the other reason, <laughs> there's different things, you know, it, you can use different metals besides gold leaf. And um, I like the gold leaf because it will adhere to itself and it loves the, the heat of your hand too. So you can use silver, there's white gold leaf, which is 50% silver and 50% um, gold. We'll, uh, we'll get into that later when we get into materials, but there are there other things to use other than gold, other metals. But I like it just for that reason. It makes a nice smooth back. It wants to, when I overlap those sheets, it wants to adhere to itself with that little bit of warmth from my hand. And so, okay, so now I've got all of the gold leaf on the back of the print. And in doing that, I've actually put extra on the outside, right? Because I don't, you know, I'm not going to be exact, but I'm going to take that off now. So now I'm cleaning that off and that's where my little pimento jar comes in. I take that brush and I just kind of very gently go down the gold leaf will, will peel off because there's no glue in those areas, right? And I stick it in the pimento jar for, for later use, uh, for patching, or you can also um, put the gold leaf in like a spice grinder and make you know, like fine powder, and you can, you, you can use it that way too in certain applications. Um, and also what happens with the brush is that now I'm kind of going down the edge of the gold leaf, and so it, it's not a perfect edge, so you might get a little bit of artist hand showing there as the brush comes down along that edge of the gold leaf. Um, and then the, this step is I take little pieces of tape too, and I'll, you know, I'll, you know, there'll be little bits and I'll very gently take that tape and pull, pull those little bits off the, off the vellum. I um, mean, you need to be careful not to get too close to the actual stuff that you want to stay because you can pull it off. <laughs> okay, so now it's time to protect the gold, I say. So this is the back. It's all been cleaned up. It's all nice and looking lovely. So this gold, the gold leaf, this 24 karat gold leaf, is really not going to tarnish. But I still want to protect it, and I want to make sure that you know so it doesn't scratch or and that sort of thing. Um, if you use something other than the 24 karat gold leaf, if you use silver or even if you use white gold, you're definitely going to want to protect the back because it will change. It will tarnish. Um, 
So, and I do the same, kind of the same thing. So now I've got this finished print back facing up, put on a piece of mat board and I take it outside and I spray it um, with, it, you can spray it again with a varnish or you can spray it with a triple thick clear glaze like Nancy uses. And so what this is doing is not only protecting the gold, but now I'm, I've made the, the vellum sheet a little more transparent, right? Okay, so probably the most important step I didn't picture. Anyway, so after this, <laughs> I'm gonna flip it over to the front and you're gonna see the finished piece. And now I'm gonna spray that too. That's really the most important step because now I'm spraying the front with the varnish or the triple thick clay glaze. And now that is gonna make that translucent, that vellum sheet even more translucent. So you're gonna see through the color into the gold. It's gonna make it, you know, again, the color of the black and white pop, but it also adds a lot of depth. Okay. Okay. Now we're just going to talk about materials, all the materials that Nancy and I have used in explaining these processes. <laughs> uh, so there's vellum paper, there's varnishes and coatings, there's artist tape, masking tape, gesso, sizing, or again, that's the adhesive for the gold leaf, the metal leaf. And then we'll, we'll tell you if you want to try this on your own, the uh, Dan Burkholder uh, sells kits, a little introductory kit, so you can get a shot that way. And we're giving you this. We don't make any money off dance kits. No, let's, no. let's make that clear. Um, so if you want to jump in. Sure. Here. Yeah. Okay. So we do use the inkjet vellum paper. It typically comes in eight and a half, 11, 12 and a half by 18 and a half. It depends, you know, it depends on where you purchase the vellum paper. Um, you can also try other translucent paper, some Japanese papers as well will work. Um, our favorite place that we get our vellum is clear, and the name of it is the Clear Chartham Translucence. It's CT Clear, 30 pound and 113 GSM. And these are the sources that you can get it. So Glowdown, I think that's our latest one that I mm -hmm. purchased from. And then there's a couple others, announcement converters and paper paper papers. And so there's the, the links there that um, you could purchase that from. And this is just a shot of the triple clear glaze. It's Krylon. I get it, oh gosh, um, Amazon, um, Michaels, um, Joann's, like anywhere that there's crafts, you can purchase that. And I would just watch pricing because the, um, you just never know what can happen. <laughs> the prices are all over the board. No, yeah, and then these are typically the varnishes that I use. I don't, I don't typically use the triple fit clear glaze. I'll use either the UV archival varnish or the Kamar varnish. Um, my favorite right now is the UV archival for obvious reasons because then it protects, it protects that print from the from the UV rays of the sun. So that's those are my two favorites. And this is a spray gesso um, from Krylon as well. The same places that you can order it from. And I usually order six at a time. So just it's just easier to keep it in stock because sometimes you'll, you'll find it out of stock and then it's like, uh-oh, I need to make a print really quick. So I like to have extra stock on that. Okay, and then gesso, just in general, I just kind of did a little bit of research. You know, what is gesso? Um, historically, it was made with rabbit skin glue chalk or uh, gypsum mm -hmm. and uh, and then they added like a white pigment um it was called at the time gesso a glue gesso or italian gesso and then in 1955 there was a modern version made by a gentleman named henry levinson and it really provides a really smooth surface and it, you know obviously for painting it holds the oil holds acrylic paint you know because you are on canvas and it really works beautifully, you know, on the vellum or other papers. You can get it in liquid. If you do decide to try it with a liquid on like vellum paper, it will warp. So then you would need to like press it down with books and until you can get it flat. So that that's why the spray gesso is so much easier to work with. And then the, these, these are different, there are different types of sizing or glue. Uh, for your metal leaf. There's both spray and liquid. Um, at the end here, I'll show you my first attempt at using liquid. It's pretty funny. Um, um, but so, but liquid comes in handy. I, I use the spray. I use the spray sizing. That's what I like the best. 
There's also water-based and oil-based. Um, I use the water base. Uh, the only reason I found out that there was oil base was I was trying to combine it with uh, encaustic wax. And so, of course, it, that wouldn't work with a, with a water base. The wax would not work with a water base. So I, I did find an, uh, an oil base one. And But the main reason I think for, for me, uh, for the liquid sizing, is if I want to do, if I don't want to do the whole back of the picture, like some of the, the collaborative pieces that are, that are in the exhibit now, I put gold leaf on the front of the picture. And I did that with a brush with the, um, with the liquid sizing. So I brushed that on, you let it dry, and then you put your gold leaf. You can do it on the back too. I've done, done that as well. You just may want to do spots of gold leaf, not the whole back. So that's, that's where the liquid comes in handy. And then, okay, metal leaf, is is a wonderful complicated thing this is what this is what a booklet looks like again of the transfer or patent never use loose gold, loose gold leaf just don't do it um, but it also does come in rolls and it comes in as flakes or powders and i think i mentioned briefly if i want to do an application i can actually make my own by using my leftover pieces um, the sources where i buy my gold leaf is la gold leaf amazon has it sometimes and gold leaf products, but my, my favorite is LA gold leaf. They're, they're quick and they're close. Um, so there's also two types of metal leaf. There's genuine uh, metal leaves, and then there's the faux leaf. Um, and if, when you're starting out, you may, wanna, you may wanna buy the fake stuff, because of course it's super cheap. And if you make a mistake, no harm, no foul, right? And you don't, you're not wasting a lot of money um, on the real stuff. But uh, there's, and it also comes in the general, like gold leaf, it becomes in different carrots. So there's 24 carat, there's 23 carat. Um, there's also uh, different thicknesses. There's a single, a double, and a triple thickness in the gold leaf in particular. Uh, the triple I like when I am doing very high key images because when I overlap, you don't see the lines with the triple. If you use the single or the double, sometimes you start, you'll see the lines in the finished product of the picture. I don't like that. Other people think it's great. Um, and then there's copper, there's, uh, there's um, white gold, moon gold, excuse me, moon gold, platinum, variegated. There's just a lot of different ways to go. And again, a big warning here, all leaf is gonna tar tarnish except genuine gold. So if you're gonna do it and you want it to last, you need, you need to protect it. And then this is just, again, this is a, a link to Dan Burke Holder's kits. He has a couple of different ones. Uh, and he has videos too, right? Video instructions with there those is, kits? It, it comes with a video instruction, yeah. Yeah, so it's easy to watch, yeah. And very simple, he makes it really, really easy to follow the steps. Yeah. And, he, yeah. and he teaches you both the, the gilding, gilding kits and the gesso technique all together. in the same, yeah. In the same, yeah. yeah. So, and there's different prices there. So you can go, you know, you can get a more expensive one that has more of the genuine stuff or more sheets. Um, yeah, yeah. So is that about that? Yep. Yeah. And I'm gonna stick this here at the, at the end for me. Um, materials as metaphors. I mean, the, the gold leaf is wonderful, um, but I don't ever wanna just use it just for the sake of using it. It looks cool, I mean, it, it, it's nice. But for me, whenever I make an image, I try to, to pick the paper and the printing technique that best um, shows off the image or that best uh, carries the story of what my image is about or what my that body of work is about. So that's what I mean when materials as metaphor. So for me, that vellum paper, um, it's a veil. Right, so um, life, life's, life's experience is a veil, right? We view life through our experiences. Um, there's also, uh, between life and death, they say there's a thin veil between the living and the dead, right? So um, this is a poem that I love by Mary Oliver and she talks, talks a little bit about that. Uh, the geese flew on, I have never seen them again. Maybe I will someday somewhere, maybe I won't. It doesn't matter. What matters is that when I saw them, I saw them as through the veil, secretly, joyfully, clearly. And this has always been my reason for using, for using the vellum stock. 
And then gold, you can see, I love, this is what you don't want to happen. You don't want the gold <laughs> on your fingers. But gold has a rich history in art, right? Um, so for me, again, it's, it's symbolic of divinity, scarcity. Um, I think what I liked most about it was that gold is one of the most indestructible metals, but it's also one of the most pliable and soft metals. And I found the dichotomy of that to be so, so interesting and meaningful to me. So that's why I love the gold. So what I did was, um, I've got three examples. The first example is literally the print on vellum right out of the printer. So you see, you can pass it around. So that's right off the printer. The next print here is the triple glaze. So it's sprayed on both sides. So you can see it makes it much more transparent. Um, and then of course you can even put it on like white paper and you'll see like the pop of color. So you can see the, the difference between the two. And I love the vellum because, you know, and once you spray it and put the gesso on it, you really have a luminosity and it creates a lot of depth. And, you know, for my series of, this part of the series of luminance and it really does accentuate the meaning behind the whole series. This is my print. All right, just as I print it out. There we go. Nothing on it, just the print. That's the front. That's the back. And you, when you do this, there's not a lot of difference between the front and the back. The front's going to yeah. be a little glossier than the back. So, uh, um, CT Clear, you can print on both sides of it, right? But as far as this shows through, right? So when I, you're going to want when you print the front, that's going to be your, your front. You're going to want that to be uh, the top side of the print, right? The back is where you put all of your adhesive and your gold leaf. So you can see if you look at that, there's a difference between the front of the sheet and the back of the sheet for how the print shows through it. I guess that's one. Yeah, yeah. there's not a definite. No, not definite back. side. No, you can put it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is this is the front, and for this one, just for demonstration purposes, this has triple glaze, triple thick clear glaze on the back. Ah, there we go. You can <laughs> see the gloss, and then again, you can see you can really see my hand there, and that's just on the back. Right, I haven't put any on the front yet at all. There's no coating on the back of this print. There is the I never got the right way. Okay, here we go. So there's the back of it with the gold leaf, right? But on the front to demonstrate, oh yeah, I guess you can't see it. Half is half is varnished and half is not. So you can kind of see the difference there. It, you know, between this is really glossy, right? And the other side is not. It's just you're not getting any shine at all, right? Just to show you the difference in how it reacts. This was brushed on, right? This is when I first started. I tried. I don't know if you can see all those buckles. Can you see all the buckles and ridges in the paper? So this this is not the CT Clear. This was another uh, sheet of vellum I had for my printing days when I worked for a printer. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll use that. And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. So all the buckles happened in the printing process? No, it happened when I put, I, I used the liquid uh, sizing, brushed it on, and then when it, it just, the paper just went like this. And some of these vellum papers do that. So they're just real uh, moisture sensitive, I guess. Plus, on the front, it doesn't look too bad on the front, but, um, but you know you don't want. I don't even know if you can see it from the side. It's even buckling from the side. Yeah, that's this one is a split. Also, I think this one you can see even more, right? So there's triple glaze on the back side of this particular image. On the front, there's triple glaze on the on the left and nothing on the right. So again, just a little. This shows the difference between putting. Um, a coating on the back and on the front. There are also other things you can do um, with this process. So this is uh, a cyanotype, okay, and um, 
and this is silver on the back. Can you talk about the cyanotype process a little bit? Yeah, um, it's an iron-based process. You can buy, you can, you can make the chemicals required for this process. It's also very easy to buy. There's like a part A and a part B liquids. You mix them together. You paint. Um, once that, it's, so it's a light sensitive chemistry that you're making with the cyanotype. So it's like the old blueprints, right? So um, you can put it on this kind of paper. You can put it on, typically you'll see it more like on um, cotton base, um, uh, Fiber based paper, cotton fiber based paper, right? So you paint it on with a brush, um, you let it dry, then you can uh, use a negative on top of it, which is what I did for this particular print to make an image. Then you expose it to the UV light with a negative. Um, that can be in that light box that I showed you that I have in my, in my studio at home. It can also be the sun outside. You can use negatives, you can also use plant material. You can make photograms, you can use inanimate objects and put that, put that on top. You put the uh, light sensitive chemistry on the top of the paper, you put your negative on, you put it in the contact frame so there's nice contact between the negative and the paper, you expose it, um, then when it comes out, planetite is great because you develop this with water. So you put it in water, you rinse it, um, and the blue will come up over, uh, over time, or that deeper blue, um, but you can also put a little bit of peroxide in the water and that makes it come up the deep blue right away. Mm -hmm. But eventually, even if you don't do that, eventually it'll go it'll to dark with it. So um, doing, doing cyanotype on this kind of paper, though, you have to put it in water. So there is a paper that I use called Vitalon Vellum for this. And I've also made like a little like screen, like a window screen almost, because when this paper gets wet, it's going to want to tear very, very easily. So because this has to get processed in the water, I'll put that screen in there, put this on, and then lift it out. So I'm not picking it up by the ends, which I've done a million times in the paper. But then this one, again, is the same thing. This is cyanotype, and this really shows you how you know we've brushed on the chemistry there. And this one has, this is faux gold. I can tell you that right now. I can't see. And the full gold also comes in larger sheets, so it's, it's very forgiving for practicing in the beginning. And then here is one, again, with the cyanotype, but this is the copper leaf. So, and then, you know, but copper, again, putting this stuff on the back, every metal is a little different. So the copper doesn't want to stick to the back. So I know by looking at this, what I did was I applied several layers of copper to get this to all lay down flat. And again, this is copper with the cyanotype. You can, you can see a little bit more on this one. But this how it sort of lays. I've patched this one, I can tell, to try to, you know, there, it flakes up and you don't want it to flake up. You got to get it on there and get it to stay. Otherwise, it's just going to pull off or fall off or something. Photography is a hybrid process. Right. So you can, a lot of, everybody has a digital camera, but you can also make digital negatives. Uh, and then use analog processes with your digital negatives, right? So to make those digital negatives, we use uh, like an acetate, almost like it used to be like, I'm showing my age here, like overhead projector type thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Kind of like that. But anyway, it's, it's a special material that is made specifically to make digital negatives, and that's called Pictorico. So this is a piece, uh, so this is a piece of Pictorico. Um, See how see how transparent that is. There's no varnish, nothing on that. This is just that acid, that clear acetate Pictorico. So you can see the difference. So I printed the image on the front and I put the gold leaf on the back. See, but see how it's flaking up here, right? That's what you don't want to have. No, I, that can be fixed. that can be remedied. But I like to show it because that's what can happen uh, with all those other metals, right? And you can fix it, but it just takes a little extra work. This is kind of cool. The effect of it is when you when you get it here, you pass it around. You know, in certain lights, you almost don't see it, and then the light will hit it in a certain way, and it just you see the gold everywhere. So, do you want to do this for every image? I would say no. There's a friend of Nan's and, and mine who um, he's doing a series now on the Pictorico, 
but it's all like church iconography. And, yeah. And silver is also difficult to work with because unlike the gold, it doesn't want to stick to itself. So you have to be patient. You know, just have to kind of work with it a little bit. I'm not that patient. <laughs> and again, if you look on the back, you can kind of see, you can see little areas in here that came up and then I push back down. And again, that sometimes where I'll use that liquid size also, but you gotta be careful with that. You don't want to put too much liquid on these because then it'll really show where you, you try to, to put it back down. So just be very judicious, like maybe take the brush and just really get almost all of it off. You don't need much. If something starts, if that metal leaf starts to pull back up, you don't need much to get it back down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but it's just a different, it's a different look. You know, the pack of gold leaf that I get, hopefully. Oh yeah, I think I bought the one that shows the tarnish. So you open it up like this. These are the packs, right? And then you can see they're they're interleaved with that tissue. See it here? There's just it looks almost gold right on the edge. There, kind of can see it a little bit. No, kozo, kozo, kozo or dampy or Japanese papers. So we'll pass these around too. Um, and it's just a different texture. You can kind of see the texture of this paper, right? And then, of course, with the, with the varnishes or the, or the triple thick clear glaze, you're going to make even these beautiful Japanese papers. You're going to make those more translucent as well. Right? But same same process. You can really see the squares there. Um, watch. Oh, I experimented with this. This is this is also another experiment. I don't know if you can see like on the leaves. I tried to get them to be different. Well, yeah, or just more translucent, just on those certain leaves. So I, I think I was using some wax or something here. Um, so you can kind of see that. So again, this was just an experiment. But the other fun thing about this piece is if you turn it over, you can see moon gold. This is a different color. So that again, this is this has been combined to, you know, and, and it's it's fun because man's work is is the beautiful in camera double exposures, right? So these aren't in camera, we're creating double exposures by blending different photographs within Photoshop to create something something completely different. And then this one, this one's my favorite. Oh, my favorite of the newer. Yeah. yeah. This one is the clouds with the bird eggs. Well, what's also kind of cool about this is that from man's cloud image, this is, I know this is so hard to see, but it's really a cool little detail. There are actually trees right here. That's part of her image. And then some trees and sky over here from man's image also. So it's like this hidden little, yeah. little gem. <laughs> but Christina Z. Anderson, uh, she does books on bichromate, gum bichromate, cyanotype, zeotype. Um, uh, they just did, well, I guess it was a different author. Anyway, she has a whole library of these books, but they're fun. And I say, as I said, if you want to do these processes, it's, these are great how-to books to get. Is there a vellum setting on the printer? In the in the Dan Burkholder kit, he will give you every, like if you have like an Epson printer or something, he'll give you the whole rundown for how you should set up your printer. So um, it's... It's the printer manages the color. So if there's no ICP profiles, you'll be using, it'll be the matte black ink out of your ink inkjet printer. Um, so yeah, so uh, black point compensation, I think that's checked. Um, the big thing that he talks about too, especially in Epson printers versus Canon printers, is you're gonna want to slow the process down as the sheet goes through your printer. So there's a setting in there that you'll set to about 10 and it from zero to 10. And that's that that slows that print down. So it's just real to go boop, 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 boop. Okay. And then there's also an ink setting in there. You can adjust that ink setting. So um, for my prints, I take it what he recommends is to take the ink coming out of the printer down like to a negative 10. So it just takes a little bit of that ink off the sheet, you know, which I think for that, for the vellum paper is good because you don't want to get, 
you know, when they get bogged down, you bog down too much with the ink. But yeah, in Dan Burke Holder's, um, in his yeah. kit, in his video, he'll, he'll give you all the settings for your printer. Yeah. 